Okay. Um, so I just wanted to um, take this opportunity to uh, kick off our um, our CME um, that we do uh, once a month. That is an endourology stone disease, and um, typically this is led by um, Dr. Amy Cranbeck, and she just uh, was unfortunately not able to be here today. So it's my pleasure to introduce one of Amy's um, good friends and long-term collaborators at uh, Professor Roger Sir. He is presently at, at UCSD and had actually has done most of his uh, uh, faculty career in the San Diego area. You were in the Navy for 20 years. Is that, Rod, is that right, Roger? That's correct. Yeah, I retired and from the he, Navy. He retired as a captain in, in the captain, correct? Correct. Ca retired as a captain in the Navy and then um, transitioned into like a, a, a kind of cool set up where uh, you're based at in a Kaiser uh, facility, but have a, a appointment at UCSD and, and do collaborative work with, with UCSD as well. So kind of a nice balance of, of, of uh, academic and, and clinical um, uh, opportunities. Uh, Roger uh, has collaborated with Amy on many things, but um, uh, stands tall in his field in his own right with uh, numerous publications, been involved in many, many clinical trials um, that have explored ways to optimize outcomes for people who have uh, stone disease predominantly, but different approaches. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm the type of guy who enjoys prospective trials that really inform decision making versus just saying that you, you do it this way because it's better. So I definitely appreciate that, even though we are in different different orbits. Uh, I, I like that and I certainly have tried to do the same thing in my career. So uh, without further introduction, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Roger. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thanks, Dr. Schaefer. I really appreciate that. I'm really honored to have been invited to this venue. Uh, ultrasound is something that I kind of self-taught myself back in 2015. And what I want to do in the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes is share with you what I've learned. And I think if I can learn it, um, you know, I think anyone can learn it. Uh, just a matter of, I think at the end of the day, um, it's like anything you do, just got to get the reps in, you know, whether it's baseball or some sport that you like, getting the reps in there and feeling comfortable. And after a while, things, um, you start having clarity once you've done it over and over and over again, right? So uh, here's a uh, video of a, a catastrophic thing that, so to speak, happened to me. I'll show you and how ultrasound kind of helped me out here. This is a live case in 2017. Hey, Ben. It's Dr. Papa Giannopoulos here. I'm helping me with my fellow. We're doing a uh, left PCNL, and uh, Dr. Beaches is going to give the history here. Great, thanks. Hi, everyone. So this is a... Uh, we have a 57-year-old woman with a history of chronic left-sided flank pain. She uh, otherwise has no past medical history. She has normal labs. Uh, was found on CT scan to have a large left-sided stone, which we'll show you here. Uh, she did have a positive urine culture preoperatively, positive for E. coli, and she completed one week course of antibiotics. Uh, the stone is a 1.8 centimeter left renal pelvis stone. Townsfield units approximately 1,200, uh, and the skin to stone distance is approximately 9 to 11 centimeters, as shown here in this axial scan. Some coronal images show the stone is pretty centrally located. There are some areas of uh, hydronephrosis in the lower pole and the mid poles. There's also a small uh, collection of lower pole stone pieces as well. This is a view from the sagittal. So Dimitri uh, was my fellow at the time, and he uh, put up a retrograde catheter for me ahead of time and then shot the retrograde. And this is the image that I got here. It became a complete blackout, basically. He had put the catheter, God bless Dimitri, uh, through the ureter and perfed it. And um, I thought I was, I'd gotten access, and this is what I saw when I got in. Again, this is a live surgery at the World Congress of Endurology in 2017 being broadcast to Vancouver while I was in San Diego. Kent Pace is moderating with Ben Chu. All right, that is not good. good. I'm getting a lot. All 
All right, this is not in the collecting system here. <laughs> okay. Not good. Okay. We're going to reaccess here, actually. I don't think this is in the collecting system. Roger, we're going to let you get organized a little bit while we uh, get the case history from one of the other yep. operating CRM rooms. In, please. Sure, okay. sounds great. Yeah. yeah, the upper pole looks good. Yep. So they went on to, uh, they muted me, thank God, at this point as I was freaking out. And um, they went on to uh, Wake Forest, where I think Jorge Gutierrez was operating, doing another case. And I was scrambling since I had no picture anymore. But I had kind of, for two years, been doing ultrasound. So I thought, of course, I dropped one of the pieces at that point. Um, I um, I said, this is my only chance to get back in is use the ultrasound. Yeah, I dropped one of the critical, the uh, needle holder for this uh, guide. So it was one more strike against me. I had two strikes going into this case now. Give me some light here. Okay, there I go. Okay. Can I have some apnea, please? You can actually see the stone, the hyperechoic stone there, and the hydrogen no, like to do apnea. Keep the uh, pleura out of it. Dropping the needle. I think the needle's in that space right now. Very subtle finding here, ultrasound. obviously, which we'll go over. But I went ahead and uh, I saw urine, so I dilated up. And at first I said, oh, gosh, I'm still outside. But then I, I saw a hint of urothelium, a lot of blood. And um, fast forwarding here, I was able to suck out some of the blood and... Fortunately, I was in the collecting system with that in highly impacted UPJ stone, so I was relieved, and I got lucky, obviously. But uh, ultrasound was uh, a modality that really helped me out here. These are my disclosures. I don't think any of them are really relevant to what we're talking about today. Um, this is another video demonstrating the ultrasound guided PCS early in my career and um, show you some tips Today here. I'm doing a left sided PCNL on a patient with predominantly renal pelvis and lower pole stones. He's in the prone position. We're feeling for our landmarks before attempting an ultrasound access, and we feel the contour of the 12th rib along here, as well as paraspinous muscles here. And then our iliac crest down here. This is Dr. Papa Giannopoulos. We usually start with the probe ver oriented vertically just to get a sense of how the kidney is lying on ultrasound. And once we see that, then we internally rotate the probe approximately 30 degrees to find our parasagittal plane where we can see the calyces entering the renal pelvis. <clears throat> and now we're just surveying the kidney from medial, now back laterally and in this case ideally an upper pole stick would, would allow us to treat his entire stone burden stick seeing rest feels there just about 12 here there's no obvious lung coming through here it's another beauty with ultrasound, you can always get the pleura. You would see it up, up here. I think this is key, that when you're in the prone position, to have the probe at a 30-degree angle in line with the anatomy of the kidney. It kind of gets you around that rib. You can see that dark shadowing. That's the rib. So get around the rib by angling the probe. Right there, that's the one you're going for, aren't you? Yeah. Very subtle here, but you'll see the needle kind of going in. Needles in. Okay, you can let him breathe. Again, it's not clear cut, but you just see kind of a deformity of the the kale kind of moving as the needle drops into it. Okay, you can let him breathe. 
let him breathe. That's part of this is um, getting used to being familiar with the very subtle signs of seeing the needle. I mean, obviously, the first time you may not see it, but over time you start to kind of I don't want to say hallucinate the needle. You can see the track, you see the surrounding tissue as the needle's moving through the tissue. Again, a lot of this just takes practice over and over again. So move the wire. Yeah. Yes, you're online. Go ahead. So move the wire. I think this demonstrates another principle of ultrasound is that things are seen easier when they're moving. So whether it's the needle or the wire, just kind of always having it slightly in motion helps you to see uh, and that really uh, emphasizes the echogenicity of the structure. Yeah, take her off the bed. So we always perform apnea, have the anesthesia do apnea when we're dropping the needle, stabilize the kidney. I don't know if you saw that it was a very subtle movement right there in the calyx, but that movement inside the calyx was the needle dropping into the uh, calyx. And the repetition of this uh, technique gets you more and more familiar with the subtleness of what you see, and over time, it's a lot more obvious to you. Before I did my first case, I would uh, just, every time I went to a perk, I would just basically um, repeat. Uh, I would use the ultrasound over and over again for every perk, and I never did it. I never you put the needle into the uh, kidney, but I would just look at the kidney and stare at it. And then one day, my fellow's like, "Why don't we just do it?" And I'm like, "It's right there, huh?" He's like, "Yeah, let's just do it." So we went ahead, put the needle through the guide into the kidney, and voila, we saw urine. We're like, oh my god, it was that easy. And I can tell you, I actually think my trainees feel like doing a uh, Ultrasound guided access is probably easier than doing um, fluoroscopic guided, guidance. And I think the reason is, as you train your eye, you end up seeing the needle entering the calyx much easier than um, with fluoroscopic guided access. So the question is, begets, why are we still performing fluoro guided access? I think there are two reasons in my mind. Um, you know, here's some kind of unpublished data uh, in our early years from 2018 to 2019 consecutive cases, uh, the first column shows just pure fluoro and this column of 34 cases shows ultrasound with some spot fluoro after we get the needle in. And you can see the difference in uh, fluoro time, 66 versus 22 seconds, 87 seconds of dilation versus 75. And the total fluoroscopic time is uh, much lower for the ultrasound guided access. Um, so, and again, they're not huge numbers, but I think if we have the opportunity to, you know, follow the Alara as low as reasonably allowable, ultrasound certainly aligns with that principle and gives us an opportunity to spare not only the patient but also ourselves um, radiation. And if you believe that it's easier, like a lot of my trainees do, like a lot of my PGY2s get their own access now with the ultrasound, um, then why not use a modality that is safer and easier? Well, this is one of the reasons, one of the two reasons I think that we um, we don't use ultrasound, or at least I was scared to use ultrasound. I couldn't see the kidney. I didn't know how to really visualize the kidney well. And so what I did one day is I actually dedicated a whole morning and I went down to the radiology department and I uh, had a uh, radiology tech, uh, she let me shadow her, kind of like just coattail her, like medical students coattail attendings, right? And uh, I just coattailed her for the whole morning and she just ultrasounded patients and she showed me a lot of the buttons that were kind of a mystery to me. Now there are numerous buttons on every machine. so. What I wanted to do is kind of share with you four buttons that I think that are critical to at least starting. It's probably the only ones I ever use, actually, when doing ultrasound, if even all of them. Maybe one or two I might use. But I think these are four good buttons to know when you're in. It's called knobology, the this, this study of uh, understanding the knobs on the ultrasound. So let's, um, and again, I think this is probably key things. If you can spend some time 
learn, understand frequency, depth, focus, and gain, that would go a long way to your ultrasound guided access. Again, every machine is different. This is a um, BK machine. You can see the TGC, the gain over here, the depth, um, frequency and range are um, on other buttons, but every machine is different. You just need to familiarize yourself with the machine that you're using. Uh, frequency is the cycles per second of the signal being emitted. I think it's really important to understand there are two different, We were, if we were to categorize uh, probes into two different types, there would be high frequency and low frequency probes. High frequency probes are really useful for superficial structures like the testicle or the penis or vessels if you're trying to use ultrasound to gain uh, access for an IV or a central line. Low frequency uh, uh, probes are useful for deeper structures, organs, uh, solid or hollow viscous organs. So in this, uh, for a PCNL, you want to use a low frequency probe. If you use a high frequency probe, you won't be able to see the kidney very well. So that's important to know. Depth. Depth basically is uh, the ability to change uh, the size, of what the image looks like to you. Um, I don't know if you've ever walked in and to do a, maybe a prostate ultrasound and the prostate's really, really small or really, really big. That's because someone has changed the depth on your machine and you just need to change, di change the dial so that the picture looks more ideal. And in this case, here's a depth uh, button and we just rotate it. And when we rotate it, the picture goes from being way too big, to, you know, occupying the entire um, screen to, uh, this is too small, to just right. So what is the right size? Well, the right size is whatever you like. I think sometimes it's pretty obvious, either too big or too small, because someone has changed the depth. Just alter the depth to the size that you like, and suddenly um, the picture seems right. I think another thing that's good to know is the focus. Some of the older machines use a focus, um, but the newer machines don't they automatically focus. And if you have an older machine, the way that you'll know where the focus is is on the side here. You'll see typically some type of marker, typically a triangle or some type of symbol. And basically, um, between two focal zones, if there's two of them on here, is where the region of interest will be best highlighted. The, uh, the fidelity of the image will be really good between these two lines. Sometimes you may only have one focal zone. Let's say, for example, that they just have this triangle here. Well, what that would mean is that anything below this point from here on down is the focal zone. So it really depends on how many uh, symbols you have up at the time. One focal zone, again, is anything below it is all uh, the area of interest. If there's two focal zones, it's the area between the two. And uh, the, some of the new machines no longer have these focal zones. They automatically focus. I don't know how they do it, but they do. Uh, gain and TGC. I actually think this is one of the most important things to understand and, and to use when you're doing ultrasonography. Gain is the control mechanism for varying the sensitivity of your probe. Um, your probe uh, oftentimes will have, you can't see it, but inside this probe there would be like six or seven different little uh, transponders. Each transponder generates uh, in sync, or in, um, not in sync, but they're, um, they alternate uh, generating acoustic energy. As the acoustic energy leaves the probe, it will assuming you have it against the body, right? It will hit a structure of certain density and depending on the density, um, a certain amount of energy will then return back to that transponder. And depending on the sensitivity of your transponder, it will then dictate how bright or how dark your image is. So here in this case here, you can see that the sensitive, the, the transponder is up here on this curved part, right? There's probably about six different transponders all throughout this probe. As each of the transponders uh, generates energy, it hits a structure like the kidney, which is a little more um, dense than the fat around it. It then returns back to the, pr the probe and it gives you the picture. And so different densities create different uh, pictures. Now, depending on, here you see on the left-hand side, that the sensitivity of your probe is very high. The person has turned up the gain, so there's too much gain. It's too bright. Whereas on the right-hand side, you can see that the gain is insufficient. Uh, there's not enough gain. 
So it's a matter of turning that dial so that you optimize your gain. And here you can see a live image of a sagittal view of a, pro of a bladder with a prostate. You can see that it's too dark or it's too light initially, it becomes too dark, and then they, they alter it to just what they want to see. Um, the other aspect to this that I want to talk about here is the TGC. The TGC is, uh, let me go backwards actually, is it's right here. It's these buttons over here, these funny looking buttons. And it's really important before you start your ultrasound to always look at the TJC. And the reason is just like the depth, your previous user may have um, messed with these TGC buttons and it will change what your picture looks like. Basically the TGC is the gain for each level of the monitor. So this is the lowest, there's a lower, um, this button controls the lower part of your monitor and this button up here controls the upper part. So each of the buttons uh, corresponds to a certain horizontal portion of your image. And so let me show you here in live what that would look like when you're altering it. So here you can, and actually there, on your monitor, you will actually see the, the, um, this line. This line represents uh, the TGC button. So these two buttons over here have been slid over to the right. This one's been slid over to the left, and these are in the middle. Um, so you can, you can put them all in the middle, ideally, which is where I like to start, and then you can alter it as needed. Uh, here you can see that the TGC for this part and for this part is a little bright. Why is that? Well, because they took that person slid the button all the way to the right here, and that person slid the button all the way to the right here. So that's why it's super bright. The gain, the sensitivity is too high here. So what we do is we take the button and slide it back to the middle, take this, slide it back to the middle, and you get this line here, and hence the picture looks a little more um, consistent with what you would expect. Here you can see a live picture of um, a bladder and a prostate and someone is altering, you'll see the lines move on the right-hand side because they're sliding the TGC buttons. As they slide the buttons, the corresponding horizontal portion of that image changes in sensitivity and brightness. Again, the most important thing here is alter to the way that you like it, but make sure you look at it because if you're having trouble seeing the kidney, it might be very well because your predecessor, whoever used the machine prior to you, had altered the TGC, and that's why you can't see anything. Okay, I think the second reason that we uh, struggle, uh, we don't want to do ultrasound is because we can't see the needle. Um, you know, if you can't see the needle, it's kind of terrifying to pass a sharp object into someone and you don't know where it's going. Um, there are some things that we can do here. You can see a case. This is uh, I was in Vermont and we got the access successfully into the kidney, but I never even saw the needle going actually into the kidney. And, and as you can see here, I, it was, I reported and I was like, where's the needle? And I'm the one who got the access. I got a, I had a hint of this. I saw the tissue moving. I keep replaying this on a loop here, but I never really saw the needle. And so that's kind of a, a terrifying feeling if you're trying to do ultrasound and you're going to stick a sharp object and you can't see the needle. Now I've done, I had done many of these at this point, so I felt comfortable seeing the tissue move, but I never really saw the needle per se. So one of the tricks you can do is um, you can pass a scope from below. Uh, do look at a combined endoscopic uh, PCNL. And when you do that, you can see the scope moving there. Um, here you see the scope in the upper pole. It's moving. And not only can you see the scope, but you can also uh, create some hydronephrosis for yourself, which is critical for you know ultrasound guided access. You need some hydro. Uh, another uh, benefit of passing a scope from below is you will identify, well, which calyx do I want to come into? So the, the scope from below identifies, okay, I want this calyx. Well, I'll create some hydro, and then I'll move the scope so that when I pass my needle, I can go right to that moving scope. So there's multiple advantages of uh, passing a scope from below, especially when do, um, trying to get access. Um, then it kind of begets the question, should you use a, a guide or should you freehand it? I don't think there's a right answer. 
Uh, for me, I, I use a guide all the time because I feel like that translates better for the trainees. Um, you know, I'll get a junior resident with me for four months and I'm thinking, am I really going to teach them freehand in four months? And then they have another uh, four year, uh, three years to go before they graduate and they don't work with me. Are they going to be able to use this technology three years later when they graduate? So I'm thinking what would be best for them um, so this becomes a durable and sustainable type procedure. And so I, I've kind of decided a needle guide is, is helpful. Um, it's a crutch if you want to call it, but I think it's a nice crutch because it gets the job done. But it's not to say that as you get better and better, that freehand um, shouldn't be something that you do. I mean, I, I feel confident and I have had to do it at times at freehand. Um, I can do it just because I've done it so often. So when you get more familiar, you can transition to a freehand and a freehand does have some advantages. Uh, the advantages of having a needle guide, like I alluded to, is it levels the learning curve and uh, it makes you more motivated to want to do it since you know that the lines, um, even though you can't see the needle at times, you know that the needle is going through that line, the dotted lines on the monitor. Uh, some of the disadvantages, though, is that it's uh, there are predetermined angles, so it limits what you can do, whereas if you have a free hand, you can do any angle you want right? because you have a free hand. But with a needle guide, you have to accept the angle that the probe gives you, and it may not be an ideal angle. Um, I think it's also a little pearl here. When you're doing ultrasound guided access to preload the needle into the probe ahead of time, there's nothing more frustrating than you see the um, uh, the, the calyx of interest, you're all ready to go. And you're like, oh, here, let me grab the needle. And all it takes is a little movement of your the hand that's holding the probe, and suddenly that beautiful image is gone. You're like, oh, where's the hydro? Or like, where's, where's the kidney again? And you got to start all over again. So just put the needle, preset it into the probe ahead of time. That way you don't have to duplicate things and uh, lose time. This is the uh, Hitachi Aloka probe that we also use. A um, little trick here, too. If you're struggling to see urine, you can inject some methylene blue from below through a retrograde catheter or through your scope. Uh, here we use an occlusion balloon, too, to maintain the hydro. Again, like I said, preload the needle into the ultrasound guide. This person was actually supine. This is probably one of my first supine cases I had ever done. Um, I think right there. And um, here you can see the gain is really dark. It's too low. Note the poor image. So I turn up the gain so I can see the kidney better. Okay, now it looks like more like a kidney that I want to access. And I've got those dotted lines, so it makes me feel comfortable. Are we recording that He's recording that separately. Uh, I use this I Boston right Scientific Naviguide. I think it's pretty echogenic. That's just my personal opinion. Um, it was designed for ultrasound guided access. And like I said earlier, um, you see things better when they're moving in ultrasound. So notice my right hand is kind of has a staccato type movement. Uh, it's like it just got a lot darker for us here in the left hand side. I apologize. On, but uh, having that needle move in a staccato fashion maintains this constant motion of the needle. And like I said, things that are in motion are easier to see during ultrasonography than, than things that are static, particularly with the needle. I, um, when I do supine, I um, only do ultrasound guided axis. I find that it's easier to, um, in the supine to avoid the uh, bullseye technique. Um, this is the other machine that we have, the BK5000. It's a newer machine. I do think the resolution of this machine is better than the Aloka, but that's, again, a personal opinion. It also has three predetermined tracks if you're going to use the needle guide, so it gives you a couple more options than the Aloka. Um, the other thing here is, um, so you can see here, um, there's three different ways that you can put this needle in three different angles, and you, you can see the picture down here as well. So it gives you a couple different options. Unfortunately, you have to buy this um, disposable uh, uh, needle guides, which is very smart on their part to have done that instead of 
giving us a reusable needle guide. They give us a disposable one, which costs like $400 every time. I guess that's good marketing for your good business. Not good for the healthcare though. Um, here's the BK5000. You can see the staccato movement I'm using with the needle. And boom, you're right there in. Um, well, why not do freehand? Um, I've kind of talked about this. Uh, the advantage is you can get any angle you want. Uh, needle holders can be clumsy. Uh, they also force you into angles that you don't, don't necessarily want to use. So that's the advantage of freehand. And I would definitely encourage you when you get more and more comfortable doing it to transition to freehand, um, unless you're in a training situation perhaps. But because uh, I do think the freehand affords you a lot more options and will optimize your chance of uh, getting su a successful and a more uh, uh, an access that you really want. The difficulty is it, it may have a steeper learning curve. What's really key here is that when you're going to do it, you have your right hand, you have one hand holding the needle and the other hand holding the probe. Do not move both things at the same time. And I know my colleague Tom Chi says this too. If you're going to move something, move one of the two, but never both at the same time. If you move both at the same time, it's really confusing. And so that's probably my biggest pearl for you is that if you're going to, if you can't see the needle, you know, uh, in your right hand, then take your left hand and you can move that probe in different angles. But don't move your left hand and your right hand at the same time. You'll be just kind of like two ships passing in the dark. You'll never find it yourself. But I think the key here is you need a real stable hand that's holding the probe. Um, and just like in surgery, if you can brace your arm uh, against uh, the patient or somehow stabilize that entire hand that's holding the probe, that's really important. Um, this is kind of a point I, I wanted to make about the, um, the probe. The probe is not a flashlight in the way that it emits energy. It's more like a laser. What I mean by that is on the right-hand picture, you can see when the acoustic energy leaves each one of these transponders, it goes directly out until it hits an object and then bounces back. It doesn't spray like a flashlight where it sprays the entire uh, body. It sprays, it goes out like a laser. And so it goes straight out and the energy comes straight back. So that's important to know because when you put the needle in, if you don't recognize that, you got you you're only going to see the needle when it's in that path of this on the right hand side here. So let me just kind of play this this little video here. And that's why when you're when you're passing needle, it's better to pass the needle from the top or from the from the bottom, not from the sides here. The sides you're only in that window just for a brief couple of minutes. And let me play that again here for you. From the sides, I think it's more challenging to to see the needle, whereas if you put it from the top or the bottom, like right there, or where that needle guide is, you stand a higher chance of seeing that needle, whereas when you pass it from the sides, you only see it for a very brief moment. You're in, and if you go too far, you're out, because the probe energy comes out, like I said, like a laser, not like a flashlight. Um, prone versus supine. I anecdotally feel that the probe things, sees things better with the supine. It's probably because of the thinner musculature, the transversalis, external, internal uh, muscles. They're in general thinner than the, um, the uh, paraspinous muscles. Um, I always, before I do a perk, I will uh, ultrasound the patient to see if I can see the kidney in the supine uh, position. And I just have them lay right there, and I just quickly bring out the ultrasound, and I um, take a look at the kidney. And if I can see the kidney in the supine, then I'll do a supine PCNL. But if I can't see the kidney in the supine while they're in the clinic, then I'll just do a, um, a prone PCNL. Um, obviously, the advantages of supine, why would I do supine? I think it's quicker, less setup, easier for anesthesia. I have a, a better access from below with a combined approach. Um, you can do either approach, but I, uh, I think there are some advantages of supine, so that's why I always do a, um ultrasound in the clinic. And another reason I do the ultrasound in the clinic is it gives me more practice. And like I said in the very beginning, it's all about the reps. The more you do, the more comfortable you get, the better you feel, the more you see. 
So I've just, you know, I, every opportunity I get to ultrasound, and I'll tell you just anecdotally, it seems like the patients just love it. They're like, my tell them I'm going to ultrasound. They're like, oh, you're going to ultrasound me? Like, yeah, I'm going to take a look. Like, oh, great. Because then they get to see it. They get to, they, there's something about ultrasonography that people like. There's no radiation. They like the fact that you can verify the stone. Um, but it's a win-win doing ultrasound. And the quicker you get, in the beginning, I found that, you know, bringing out the ultrasound machine was slowing me down. I don't know if you're like me, but I'm always behind. I'm always late in clinic. But now that I've incorporated it into my practice, it's just, it takes a couple, you know, uh, maybe a minute, boom, boom, each side, and I'm done. Um, but in the beginning, it was kind of clumsy and slow, but I just kind of forced myself to incorporate it into my clinical practice. And now it's a quick portion of my practice um, to take a look.